is you know, now choosing you so related specifically to the uh, countries uh, of the what he called the uh, East. And he was constantly worrying about the fecundity of the East. Um, that is the high birth rate. I suppose that's what he can translate into. Which he thought was going to be a very big problem for what he called the civilized countries, uh, in which he did not obviously include the countries of the East. Why would it be a problem? Because um, it would lead to uh, rise in the supply cost of food. Um, you know, that rapid population growth in the East is taking place would mean that the price of food globally would rise because it would uh, express itself in the global market. And uh, this would affect the standard of living of populations in civilized countries. Uh, now, this is a sort of point of view, it's not confined to. Keynes was writing, which was just after the First World War, in economic consequences of the peace. And by the way, I found that there was no objective basis at all to experience. Because if you look at the rate of population growth in India, and you were specifically worrying about India, but that was Britain's largest colony, then there was absolute decline of population between the censuses of 1911 and 1921. Absolutely. Mainly because of the massive uh, influenza epidemic of 1980. And if you look at the period from 1900 to 1931, India's population grew 17%. But Britain's population grew by 22% over the same period. So if anything, the fecundity was in Britain, the fecundity was not in the East. And there was absolutely no objective basis for this place. The other point which, uh, uh, on which uh, I have revised my views of population, which never agreed with, uh, with the population go we begin with, uh, is the whole question of pressure on resources. Because the idea which Keynes was putting forward, and which later also, uh, more recently when you had the food price spike, uh, global food price spike of was made, so you found people like uh, uh, George Bush, who was uh, president of the US at that time, and even economists like Paul Krugman, saying that uh, uh, if not the sole cause, the major cause for the food price spike was because the very large populations of India and China, which were increasing their average incomes, were demanding more food grains, and that is what had caused the food price spike. So again, you know, the ancient fear is getting reflected decades and decades later by modern economists as well. And I realized that, uh, you know, this population voting rests on a false and other fallacy, which even Keynes was subject to. By the way, Keynes was uh, not let off on his theories. He was criticized fairly severely by William Beverly, who was a, a progressive person who later to our plan for the Labour Party for the Westing. So Bedridge pointed out there were mistakes in his argument. But the major mistake that not only means but uh, George Bush and Paul Kuhn is to take population as identical with demand. Of course it is not. Because uh, demand is not a function of numbers alone. It is also a function of your per capita income. And as a matter of fact in the three decades, is it three decades, 1994, or, or no, not three decades, in the decade and a half before the food price spike, the per capita food grains demand in India was falling, and falling quite substantially. And this is something most people don't know about, but so was the per capita food grains demand in China, because China had been diverting very large areas of land from food grains to cotton production, supply had come down, and there had been other measures, macroeconomic measures, which had impacted aggregate demand from the rural areas, in particular, very adversely. So, in a situation where per capita demand is actually falling in both the two most populous countries, this is not even known by or discussed or understood by leading economists 
in the law. And I regret to say, it doesn't seem to be highlighted even by Congress, even progressive Congress in our own country. The what is it which is leading to this kind of decline of aggregate demand which is getting affected with the decline of basic food waste consumption? So this is an area I think on which uh, people have to speak up a lot more to counter the kind of fallacious claims which are rampant to this day, which not only emanate from northern universities, but the, uh, the pernicious nature of these things uh, is not understood sufficiently, I think, by our own even progressive development companies. At least they don't talk about it, or they don't criticize these theories to the extent that they show with one or two honorable exceptions of whom our chair is one. I remember reading something you know, uh, against Putin. But um, the second thing I want to say is at a much broader level, I wind up with two moments. And I think the whole of uh, what passes for development theory after the, and as it developed in, uh, in the post war world is based on a fundamentally wrong model of what capitalism is all about and how capitalist industrialization actually took place. In the countries of its origin, it is built France, Germany, and later on uh, generalized to the United States, Canada, and so on. Uh, the fundamental model that our economies operate with is that we can replicate that part of the world. So the story goes something like this uh, You have an agricultural revolution which raised productivity in agriculture, which released labor. This was, of course, the progressive people also say that there was. Uh, this displacement of small producers, small peasants, and so on, cottagers, and so on, growing in closures movement from agriculture. But the growing industrial sector, there were several other revolutions going on commercial revolution, transport revolution. But primarily, the growing industrial sector absorbed these displaced. There might have been some frictional unemployment, there might have been a period in which there was a, some distress, but eventually they all got absorbed in the expanding the industrial sector. And the same model is now put forward a lot of people for countries like ours to say that you know, what we need is a transfer of low productivity, unorganized labor from agriculture into non the non-agricultural sector. And that is a solution to our agrarian crisis. Okay? Now, this fundamentally does not uh, is a misreading of the entire process historically of capitalist development and it is also a misreading of what is possible and what is not possible in countries like ours. First of all, there was no agricultural revolution in India, as a bit, and that is something that is can be clearly established from the empirical work that their own economists have done to the work on agriculture to show that between 1700 and 1850 Actually, the output of basic wage goods, that is of wheat, uh, actually declined. The per capita, not the absolute, but the per capita, and by a fairly substantial percentage. So, where is that without the revolution? There was social revolution, no doubt. There was emission of small cottages, there was um, the consolidation of holdings into large capitalist farms. But if you cannot even meet the wage group requirements of your own industrialization, why part of the revolution? Certainly not a revolution in productivity. So where did they get their focus from? Why was industrialization not constrained? Well, major reason was of course the extraction of colonial surplus. Either these food waste were directly extracted from the colonies or the colonial taxes were used to buy and export tropical products which were in demand in advanced countries, industrializing countries. Yeah. <laughs> Apart from talking, there should be people should be passing things around and moving all the time. Yeah, okay. Two minutes. No, I, I won't say two minutes because you distracted me too much. Three minutes. <laughs> so the whole colonial experience is something that our economists don't take into account. In fact, they don't even bother to read our own colonial history or colonial. 
And this is uh, absolutely essential, I think, for anybody to call himself or herself in the comments. Uh, once uh, some of the students interviewed me and asked me, uh, Ma'am, so you think that development economists should learn history and all this? I said, No, not just development economists, but all economists. Whether they, even if they're doing econometrics, even if they're doing something, you know, which is uh, seems to be very uh, theoretical and mathematical, they cannot claim to be called economists unless they know um, uh, economic history, at least of their own country, if not of capitalist industry. Um, the other thing is that uh, you know you did not get labor absorption in industry in the classical case. Uh, only a small fraction of this makes labor not absorbed. And there was massive unemployment. The only reason that the West European countries did not explode in revolution, a lot of social discontent, political discontent. And that is what Marx had anticipated that there would be, you know, a socialist uh, revolution on the basis of, for example, the Chartist movement uh, in England and so on. That did not happen because they out migrated on a massive scale. And this is something I keep repeating because, again, you don't find it in your economics textbooks, it's not factored in. That uh, about half the increment population in Britain every year migrated for two centuries. Between 1821, when England and Wales' population was about 12 million, in Scotland is 14 million. And 1915, 16 million persons migrated out of the country. More than the initial population migrated out of the country permanently to North America and other lands, which they had of course seized by force from original inhabitants. Is that option open to us today? If you say people should move out of agriculture, where would they go? Can industry absorb them? Of course not. Uh, at the time I was writing my thesis in the late 1960s. I found that a 9% rate of growth of manufacturing output led to a 3% rate of growth of employment in manufacturing. At least the employment elasticity with respect to output was positive. What is it now? I mean, you've already heard some figures, I think, in earlier sessions. In some sectors, it's become negative. And there are only one of those sectors in which it is at all positive. So, capitalists in our country are not interested in employment. They're interested in profit. They're interested in profit that as capitalists everywhere are interested only in profit. So if you're talking about the employment problem, that is not something which is going to be solved within the present trajectory of development. No matter how much you give impart skill to workers, you're only working at the micro level within an overall macro system which is generating more and more unemployment and underemployment. Okay, since I only have 10 minutes, let me stop there and have a look. I appreciate the sentiment. Thank you. 
from the perspective of thinking about climate change and sustainable health. So let me make a few remarks from that perspective. And uh, the fact that it may be an interruption to the train of thought of the rest of the class is not my fault, but we need to walk it. So, uh, when it comes to talking about climate change, and uh, if you have had some exposure to development and uh, related issues, and have had not so much as uh, academic, but more than the uh, activist of this experience. And my own association with the death uh, movement in the country over the last 40 years. So, from that perspective, it is clear when you start talking about climate. There are two challenges to the way development turns up in the East. So, one is a kind of mainstream climate perspective on development. It is somehow, uh, it's a sort of uh, slap that put together of a series of uh, propositions into many statements which have been thrown out and uh, discredited in the uh, economics literature by a variety of schools uh, many years ago but revived in the new concept. Methodologies which were discarded suddenly acquiring a new life. A sort of patchwork of ideas uh, uh, sort of cobbled together cobbled together and the basic idea is here is an urgent problem. We need to quantify this problem. Quantify is very important. What is it? And somehow we must have some kind of discussion uh, which leads us to some other problem. So it's a, it's a it's not to describe it uh, unless you have had some exposure to the discussion of how really slap that. Uh, it's a theory assembled by committee. It's a theory assembled by Trumpy. Very often, from Trumpy, it's a scrapyard of old economics. I know enough to say this confidently. I can even say this chapter and words. So, this is uh, one perspective. Unfortunately, because the, a lot of the academic theory on climate and development is driven by the ITCC and the ITCC is really a body of scientists who have this uh, view that here we have discovered this agent problem. This is genuinely a global problem. So then when we have this problem, how do we uh, sort of deal with the economic, social, political, technological dimensions of it? So you call up the economics department and ask them what is the answer. Attitude thinking. So, how do you mistake? Because if you ring up the climate department or the department of meteorology and ask them for an opinion on some climatological or meteorological phenomena, you will get more or less a convergent set of answers. They would differ a little bit from that, I think we don't know. But they are more or less will be in the right direction. But if you ring up an economics department, and I did not say this to this audience or any other thing, you ring up the economics department and ask them why inflation was X percent in the last month. You would probably get as many answers as there are economists. And for a very good reason, because it is somehow a discipline that is the manner in which it comes. Reflects uh, the debate and dispute. However, academic in origin they may be, they eventually do reflect concepts and divergences of opinion and viewpoints that are current in society. So, in the IPCC style of discussion about science, we have this, uh, therefore, uh, uh, this uh, regard the economics department and get an answer kind of uh, attitude. It is really a snap that. Uh, package of solutions that is sufficient as the answer. On the other hand, you know, in the 20th 
question of development uh, in relation particularly to uh, climate, to weather, the role of weather shock, all these things begin uh, in a serious discussion of climate and development. I am not for a mainly focused analysis. And that for a very good reason, because the focus has been largely on issues that pertain to uh, the economic order of the society. And there is some sense in every language, climate. Climate is a boundary condition. And so be careful not to jump I think that despite the urgency of the climate question and the urgency of the students the reality of capitalism without fudging matters. These days it's very common to come across views which basically fudge matters but that you must not forget was barely uh, a couple of decades or not even that much perhaps after independence uh, and as a result the fact that capitalism in the metropolis was the progenitor of mass poverty that capitalism has this tendency within it to generate poverty is something which was explained to me and to other students by a group of outstanding, brilliant teachers, Amartya Sen, K. N. Raj, Shugama Chakravarti, uh, Tapan Rai Chodhi, just name it. And, and that is something which has always remained with me. And I believe that is a proposition which is valid. Utsa is absolutely right. I agree with her completely that the view that capitalism can bring about development and that historically it did so is a completely misplaced view. Let's, let's look at it, you know, that the whole idea, we think in terms of development as a transfer of large masses of population from a low productivity, low labor productivity sector, the so-called traditional sector, to a high labor productivity sector, the so-called modern sector, and the belief is that this is what capitalism achieved historically. From this belief, it follows that 
even if capitalism destroys that pre-capitalist or, or the traditional sector, doesn't matter. Ultimately, all of them are going to get absorbed into the modern sector anyway. So why should we shed tears about the enclosure movement? Why should we shed tears about the fact that some peasants even today in India are getting evicted and so it doesn't matter because after all, once we have thoroughgoing capitalist development, they would all get absorbed anyway and they get absorbed at much higher levels of living than, than uh, uh, they, they were used to. And what is more, once the labor market becomes reasonably tight, these levels of living would go on improving. Therefore, we must not shed tears about the destruction of the traditional sector. That is what development is about, and capitalism would actually shift vast masses of population from the traditional to the modern sector. The theoretical counterpart of this is something which we all know as the Lewis model, which actually picturizes this transfer in a very vivid manner. Now, the point is, historically, as Utsa said, that this is something that capitalism has not achieved on its own scheme. The fact that in Western Europe, large numbers of people who were displaced from their traditional habitats because of the enclosure movement and the process of primitive accumulation of capital, ultimately did not hang around as an unemployed, impoverished, impoverished mass, was because of mass immigration. But large numbers of people, pre-capitalist producers, who were destroyed because of the influx of capitalist commodities in the colonies, which of course, after all, is an impact of capitalism, they continued to remain as a vast pauperized mass. I mentioned my teachers, Papan Rai Choudhury had this argument that the roots of modern mass poverty in India lie in colonialism. This morning when I was listening to Ram Kumar, I was quite amused by the fact that you know neither Harold Mann nor Gilbert Slater, who were worried about rural poverty, factored in uh, the whole question of colonial rule as a contributor to rural poverty. But the point is anyway, so that poverty is something which remained and remains with us. The roots, the origins of modern mass poverty in societies like ours lie with the fact of colonialism, which is the obverse of capitalism in the metropolis. You look at the theoretical side of it. When you look at the theoretical side, you look at the look at the Lewis model. The problems with it are very well known. There are three three problems I want to draw attention to, which have been drawn attention to by others. The first, of course, is no role of demand. Let's ignore that problem. Let's assume that says law holds and and and, and there is no problem of demand. Uh, that may obstruct the expansion of the modern sector. But if you think in terms of the modern sector expanding on its own steam, the fact is that all capital accumulation is associated with technological progress whose essence is a rise in labor productivity. And as a result, the Lewis model has constant labor productivity. The moment you factor in a rise in labor productivity, then it follows that the rate of growth of employment is nothing else but the rate of growth of output in the modern sector, I'm talking on the modern sector, minus the rate of growth of labor productivity. If it is the case that the rate of growth of employment, which is the difference between these two, is less than the rate of growth of the workforce, plus, of course, whatever unemployment is being generated in the traditional sector, which is seeking work in the modern sector, then it follows that you actually, far from absorbing workers from the traditional sector, you would actually be creating further unemployment in the economy. And along with it, further poverty. As a result, you may have high accumulation in the modern sector, but if that accumulation is associated with rapid rates of labor productivity growth, which capitalism engenders, then it would be accompanied by growing poverty. You know, many of you would know that this is something which is so little understood that we actually find, for instance, our political leaders talking about how we must raise productivity. No. We must, in fact, limit productivity growth if we are interested in hitting full employment. Anyway, so, so that, is, that is obvious. Now, suppose it is the case, I mean, the, the, the story doesn't end there. Suppose it is the case that actually you do not absorb the labor from the traditional sector. In that case, your wages continue to remain in the capitalist sector. Think of the Lewis model at your subsistence level. 
but your productivity is rising. As a result, the surplus is rising. Now, when surplus is rising, income distribution is becoming more and more unequal. When income distribution becomes unequal, that is something which is serious in itself, which people like Piketty are now talking about. That is something that would generate problems of aggregate demand, which I'm assuming away. But additionally, it also implies that the kind of demand pattern that is generated tends to be even less employment intensive. You, you give a rupee to somebody who is in a village, let us say, or, or you give a rupee to a worker, then the work, worker would not only spend the rupee, but spend it on commodities which are relatively labor intensive. But if you give a rupee to somebody in Delhi, in that case, the Delhi middle class person would probably not spend the rupee, or if the person does, by my assumption, spend the rupee, would do so perhaps by having a holiday in French Riviera, which would create zero employment here. As a result, you find that income distribution becoming worse would then further raise the rate of labor productivity growth and further compound the problem of unemployment. Now, this is intrinsic to the fact that capitalist growth is associated, accumulation, as Marx had said, is associated with increases in labor productivity. Suppose for a moment we assume that actually employment does increase. So I was saying that, you know, employment, in fact, in many sectors, there is negative rate of growth of employment. Let's assume that employment does increase. But when employment does increase, what you would find is that if the capitalist sector, this is the third point about the Lewis model, suppose the modern sector buys some goods from the traditional sector. In that case, if employment does increase and if the goods bought from the traditional sector are demanded by the workforce in the modern sector, then you would find that since the traditional sector is not necessarily expanding, you would find that there would be a problem. I think Ashok Mitra and Shukumar Chakravarti wrote about the whole question of terms of trade moving against uh, the modern sector. But to me, terms of trade are less important. More important is the fact that there would be an inflation in the prices of the commodities, basically wage goods, and therefore that would destabilize the wage unit and that would destabilize the value of money in the economy. At which point, there would be an effort made to cut back on employment. As a result, I'm suggesting that the rate of growth of employment is in fact the min of the two. The min of G minus the rate of growth of productivity, labor productivity in the modern sector, and what is permissible non what is permissible as a non-inflationary rate of growth of employment in the modern sector, given the uh, sluggish growth or the stagnation in the traditional sector. Now, given this, that you'd find that employment would not increase, and if employment does not increase, uh, in that case, you would actually find that poverty would actually worsen over time. Uh, two minutes? Okay, two minutes, right. Okay. So, so it seems to me, therefore, that all this talk, that you, you, you leave things to the market, create conditions where animal spirits of the entrepreneurs are boosted and so on, all that may generate GDP growth. Frankly, GDP growth leaves me cold. As I must say, it had left even John Stuart Mill cold, let alone Karl Marx. But the point is that GDP growth leaves me cold. But fundamentally, it's not going to make any impact as far as poverty or unemployment is concerned. Two, two minimal things which, which, which follow from what I'm saying. One, of course, is that therefore, Growth has to occur within what we call the so-called traditional sector itself, not through a process of primitive accumulation of capital, but by preventing a process of primitive accumulation of capital. In other words, I think a growth trajectory where petty producers themselves then through cooperatives, collectives, and so on, change their own modes of organization, and the state comes to their help in raising their rate of growth through increases in land productivity, because that is what is required for a higher growth, growth rate, which both on the supply side provides wage goods and the demand side provides markets, is one essential component of it. The other essential component is that technological progress leading to fast rates of growth of labor productivity is something which can be handled if you have a work sharing, product sharing ethic. 
Now, of course, a socialism requires a work sharing, product sharing ethic, but the work sharing, product sharing ethic, by the way, is also there if you have, uh, let us say, okay, I'll give you an example. The only countries to date which actually have hit full employment and labor shortage are the former socialist countries. Why did they do that? How did they do that? Because of the fact that they impose certain limits on structural change. In the former Soviet Union, if a mine became unprofitable, it would be closed down. Now, if the mine is not closed down, it is actually sustained through a subsidy from the government, which is raised in the form of taxes from somebody else. Now, that is an example of a work-sharing, product-sharing ethic. As a result, I think it is very important that two things. One is land augmenting technological change, which can come about by defending, promoting petty production, and through land reform, of course, that gets rid of landlordism, but on the other hand, through that voluntary development of cooperatives and collectives, and the other is the inculcation of a work-sharing, product-sharing ethic that ensures that labor productivity growth does not give rise to unemployment. These are the two essential components for an alternative trajectory, and to my mind, both these components require a kind of socialism, which is, which is precisely characterized by, by these kinds of things. Thanks, you. Okay, uh, I'm not going to be at all as uh, grand as some of the, uh, what we've heard. And uh, beginning with, you know, noting that I think Benin's friends have been a very nice, Thoughtful and actually organizing this. Let me begin with not so much the idea of development, which I had or how I changed it, but I think what most of us here would recognize, we simply go through the CFP curriculum of the time, in terms of what have we been. What, you, what was used to be taught earlier, and how has our teaching of this thing changed over time? And I think that's not a tough exercise. And I think you'll see it even in CSP's own compulsories in terms of which have ceased to be compulsories and more importantly, in terms of things which are still there on our course list, or your course list, rather, I'm not in your part, and what people actually take up when it comes to options. So development to some extent, or at least the study of development in economic departments, is to some extent itself a product of what we call economic development or the nature of it. Now let me come to my own issues. Prabhat has more or less said what were the things, what were the things which were considered important 50 years ago. And that's roughly when I was and my PhD thesis, for example, was around the issue of, and for a long time, this was essentially what Indian economists, at least those of, those of them were thinking about Indian development, were thinking about it, what are, what are the constraints to Indian growth? Yes, there was population, but mainly it was capital. There was balance of payments. Then there was the wage book problem. And we had around those issues of the problems of what was preventing India from becoming a really developed country. There was this whole attitude that we needed planning. So planning, again, about models 
which modeled capital investment, which modeled the constraints to various things like you know the price, cons the inflationary barriers, which is a very good constraint. The much more important immediate constraint then was the ex external payments constraint. And you've got a situation where at least when we were students, we were given these elaborate models. And the study of economics, at least of Indian economics, consisted in part of history, in part of standard textbook courses, macro, micro, but a lot of it was trying to actually convert into models what people were thinking about India. And the most important things people read about were Indian plans. And that is where Shukumar's great contribution we sort of summarized the whole thing. And it's, it was actually a masterly treatment of what India was, in a sense, thinking. Now sit today and think about what has happened. Number one, we hardly now talk about a balance of payment constraint at all. And that's not because we've suddenly overcome the essential problems. Our current account deficit this year will be close to 3%, which is roughly the highest it has ever, I mean, it has usually been. I mean, touched about 4 5 before, but 2.8 is higher than our average during this period. Our trade balance is well over 10% 10, 10 of GDP, and that is pretty much about the highest it has ever been. So we have not solved our external payments problems by any means. But this is not something that we think about. Why? Because they've gotten used to the idea that there will be this portfolio capital which will keep coming in. And this portfolio capital will actually make the economy do whatever it has been doing to avoid an immediate balance of payment problem. Look at our agricultural sector. Our overall rate of growth over the last ever since independence, yes, it's been about 2.5%. In that 2.5% it has been a little less than 2%. It's been 1.5%. The point is, our rate of growth of agriculture is not up by any means compared to what we were concerned about when we were thinking about a wage good constraint, when we were thinking about an agricultural constraint, and that despite the fact that the population growth rate then was 2.5% or near about that, and today our population growth rate is around 1.5%. So without agricultural growth actually growing, your population growth rate has come down, and that may have given you some uh, leave it. But today, people are actually writing, I mean, there are people who say now, that we're in a situation of continuous surpluses on agricultural goods. I mean, there are people who keep saying that the problem now is surpluses rather than. So that doesn't seem to be the problem either. The problem is that the farmers are complaining and the green crisis is not a constraint to the capital thing, the problem of the farmers themselves. Now, I think that's again important because if you look at, again, how we look at development nowadays, somehow this idea that development consists of trying to develop the forces of production and use the forces of production in a way that might serve the cause of improving the standard of living of people, somehow we have got into a situation where we don't talk too much about the forces of production at all. 
what we do instead is we talk about some macroeconomic stability. We do talk about government, but we don't see government as trying to plan any development. <coughs> what we see government doing is only really two things. One, build a little bit of infrastructure. There are infrastructure shortages, so build infrastructure. Secondly, do a certain amount of social sector spending. <coughs> and social sector spending is seen as provide health, provide some education things. But these are really add-ons. These are not, these are seen to be add-ons, not part really of the development process itself. And increasingly, and this is something I think should, should actually take into account, increasingly this is happening in a state or rather a collection of states, there's a union of India, where the revenue side, not only is it that the production side is nobody talks about, but the revenue side, that is the place where the ability to spend comes from, has been hugely centralized. At the end of the situation, the completion of the this process about the, you know, from VAT to GST, you've now come to a situation where the central government more or less collects 95% of all revenues. Now given this, you now have development seen as really people who are spending money. And spending money, it should be spent well, there should be accountancy, accountability, and therefore what it has almost got around to be is spend it on infrastructure, and also in infrastructure spending there's a lot of backing, contractors <laughs> like it. Or you spend it on some social sector expenditure, but that also in a time-bound manner, supposedly. It is not actually thinking in terms of a whole program of thinking in terms of we will develop, it's still development rather than development of people. Now I think there is something wrong. Now I can, I could go to the extent that Ravad said is somehow changing or, or at least reiterating the fact that nothing will work in capitalism. I think one needs to ask what would work in the situation that we find ourselves. It's not a question of what will something emerge from elsewhere. And as far as the whole point about that the models taken from the West and things are concerned, today I don't think most people even know about it. What they are actually thinking of is if China can do it, why can't we? I think that's really what the issue is all about. And that is a question worth asking. That is, uh, economy, an economy which is in the few things I've just talked about did exactly the opposite. They don't run the sort of huge deficits we do. In fact, the deficits we run, run our economy. There are, the deficits we run drive our stock markets. The deficits we run are really what is driving so much, I mean by deficit and external account deficit, is driving our inequalities. And I think going back to the essence of actually Cutting the economy, that the productive side of the economy to the resources at hand is something economists learned as a first, <coughs> first part of what they did. Today we've forgotten about it. And I think that is the problem of the Indian economy as compared to, say, the Chinese.
work to celebrate uh, Vinny's work, his potential, and uh, I'm glad that at least some of you all are implicitly committing yourself to realize at least part of that potential of what it promised. Uh, what I intend doing is uh, slightly different, is not really laying before you uh, a set of things uh, I think I've learned over these last four decades, which uh, I can state with certainty is something you can benefit from. But really to point to certain uncertainties which I've, I've increasingly accumulated over all these years, and uh, which I think makes it far more difficult to be a development economist today than when I started being a development economist in, when I joined uh, MA in 1973. I came from physics, uh, partly because, like him, I was uh, uh, sort of, uh, I, I, in this sense, okay, no? yeah. it was because of certain affiliations with a more anarchic left that he was associated with. And um, so when, when, when we came in, I mean, by being young, I mean, my batch in uh, that period, that, the people who came in at that period, it was an unusual period because by then it was clear that what was considered to be the principal strategy countries, underdeveloped countries should adopt when they launch on development, particularly in years after the Great Depression. Uh, the understanding was that what you need to do is uh, launch on import substituting industrialization, that you set up uh, barriers, tariffs, quantitative restrictions, you uh, formulate a set of state policies which allow you behind those barriers to then and then go closer to it and start making all sorts of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that, that you need to you know, have a set of state policies which allow you to then behind these barriers accelerate the process of growth. And you need to have uh, industrial growth and you need to support that process with uh, radical land reforms and uh, um, which actually gave land to the tiller, unleashed peasant energies, uh, created a mass domestic market for manufactured consumption goods and so on and so forth. So it appeared that a generation before us had grown up with a clear strategy which needed to be adopted in which it was possible to make significant advances within the framework of capitalism. And in fact, there were some people at that point of time uh, who began to argue, like Bill Wharton, etc., saying that actually this has been extremely successful. You know, the left says that there doesn't be much industrialization in developing countries, but look at them, actually, they are they are really, you know, forging ahead. But by the time we came, and in, in India's case, by the mid-1960s, and this is the early 1970s, by the time we came, it was clear that there was there were serious problems with import substitution. And, um, so the trajectory we had to take was to say that this is because the institutional change required to actually have successful industrialization in a post-decolonization, post-Second World War world cannot take place under regimes which pursue uh, market-dependent or market-led strategies, that you need regimes which uh, actually went in for deep institutional change, uh, a kind of socialism, however you defined it depending on the specific persuasion you came from. And uh, you had options to point to. I mean, it's true that there were problems emerging in, in, in Soviet Union, but it was there, it was doing okay. Uh, there was China, which uh, had uh, partly got over the problems of the Cultural Revolution period. So we could point to these countries. And so you became more radical. You said, listen, all this thing doesn't work. You finally need to have fundamental institutional reform, and it's possible. Look at what Vietnam is going to do now. I mean, you know, because that was, that was happening at that time. And this went, uh, went on for some time, and uh, what became obvious that was that actually in practice in most of these countries, what was, what it, what was happening was that import substitution was um, continuously being displaced by a strategy which um, undermined import substituting industrialization, but did this through, 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 the, through neoliberalism in various forms, that the whole idea was you liberalize trade, you liberalize capital flows, you go down those paths, and it depends on, on, you know, whether you come from the southern core countries in Latin America, which had started doing this early, or you came in a, you know, from India, which is where it happened later, and of course, really began to happen after the mid-1980s, but even in 1981, we already had uh, an IMF loan, and uh, all of us were joining those, uh, including Prabhat and many others, uh, attacking the government, having gone in for that loan, and, 
doing all those good things. So the thing was, it was a tension. Now, on the one hand, you needed to defend import substitution against this neoliberal onslaught. But you were coming from an environment in which you're saying this import substitution doesn't work. You actually need to go beyond this framework of you need to have institutional change. So, so it, it was a dilemma. What, what position do you take? And you have to, you know, it's actually a nuanced strategy. You needed at some points to defend Nehru, defend import substitution, etc. At other points of time, you had to say, no, no, but this this has got a lot of problems. It doesn't actually, you know, they didn't implement land reforms, etc., etc. And uh, you know, therefore, the pressure to recognize that uh, that you know there are some successes of this other strategy was well, maybe state led. There was a South Korea, there was a Taiwan, Singapore might be a small city state, but there were at least these two. And people would turn around to you and say that, listen, you, you know, Vietnamese have got two. Give us one successful import substitution. And there isn't one successful import substitution outside the framework of countries which adopted centrally planned uh, development. So then, um, you know, you, 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 you kept fighting, you kept having these new positions, till of course 1997 came, and there was a crisis in Southeast Asia which was excellent because then you said, you see, you know, if you go down, if you go down this trajectory, if you liberalize trade, then you'll be forced to liberalize, you know, remove capital controls, either as a quid pro quo or because you need the capital to finance the deficits which you have. And if you do that, boy, you're going to go kaput. And even the most successful miracles, they got it all wrong. The bank and IMF were saying these were great miracles. Next year down the line, Thailand had just been declared a great miracle and next year down the line, it had this you know, this, this, this devastating crisis. So once again, it appeared that, okay, we, we've got some leeway here. So you can say the battle is against finance. Now the problem is, of course, before this happened, the collapse of the Soviet Union happened. So in part, we had lost something. You know, we had lost something in terms of saying that we had to go and find reasons why Soviet Union was an exception. And that therefore, it doesn't mean that if Soviet Union went, you can't have an alternative with deep institutional change, which will allow you domestic market-based growth. So you needed to combine this, this benefit you're getting from the 1997 crisis with some kind of a, an explanation that uh, you know, the Soviet Union is an exception. You know, the 1999 was a complete, uh, the 91 was a complete collapse. And then you had the other problem, that uh, people then started turning to you and saying, OK, you might say the Soviet Union is an exception. Is China capitalist or is it socialist? Because look at China, of course it had some success till 1978, but look at its success after 1978. If there is, after South Korea and Taiwan, a, a, a case of a country which has actually moved from underdevelopment to near developed country status according to some indicators, then it's a country which has actually gone down a path which seems to be more of a capitalist path. And therefore, you needed to then basically say that, no, no, but you know, finally, you need, uh, you need intervention of, of some kind. You need a state which is out there and doing whatever it has to do, etc. But the only way we can we can defend it is to say that listen, you cannot, there are only two cases of success. You actually cannot have a trajectory in which you try to go on the basis of the world market because many countries have tried this now. So the case seems to be clear now that if every country tries it, it's going to be a problem. And every time one country is successful like China now, it's just one country which is successful. You don't have multiple countries which are successful at the same time. So we, we need an alternative. But the moment you say we need an alternative, then they're going to say, what is that alternative? And you have to say that you have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You've got to grow on the basis of your domestic market, particularly countries which can have a large domestic market. And then you come back to that problem of deep institutional change, but this time in a world in which you don't have examples to point to. Because China also is not particularly an example you can easily point to now. So therefore, you know, you actually have an accumulation of uncertainties. You know that there must be some way in which you can, ex you know, you can you can exit from backwardness. You know that there is no real case because South Korea, as we used to argue, you know, it's a client state. It has a special relationship with the United States. Taiwan was a refueling base for American troops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But even if we say all that and say that you know China is when China was successful, China was the only one which is successful, which is still true with that kind of a strategy that depends in significant measure on the on the world market, but then is now trying to rebalance and go on the basis of the domestic market, that you come 
to a point of time when you have to go back to arguing that you need deep institutional change. You need something called socialism, however you define it today, whatever form it takes in your definition, which allows you to be able to pull yourself up based on your own domestic market and have that strategy. But uh, some of us are, 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 are sort of gradually fading out of development economics. But for those of you who are coming in, it's a far tougher battle. You don't have anything to point to. And you have only experiences of failure in a world in which the success has still been confined to the metropolitan West, Trump notwithstanding, uh, you know, the European crisis notwithstanding. So we have crisis. We know there's a deep problem out there. But to reconstruct an alternative both conceptually and in practice has become more difficult. And uh, it leaves one with uncertainties, which makes uh, life exciting for all of you all who are now coming to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was almost brutally honest. Where do we go from here? I can open it up for uh, responses, reactions. Uh, would any of you like to come back on something that was said? <laughs> yeah, I think yes, so. Just a couple of minutes. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's a phrase which uh, Pranath has used uh, earlier, but he did, which he did not use today, which I think is quite useful. Uh, and that is uh, the idea of epistemic exteriority. It's a bit of a mouthful. So what it basically means by that is that, you know, most of us lack uh, the facility for epistemic exteriority. We cannot place ourselves outside, conceptually outside the existing system with all its constraints. So willy-nilly, we tend to internalize those constraints and therefore we do not even push for the kind of policies which we could be pushing for. And um, you know, I don't think we need to be shamefaced about the need for socialism at all, or say that it only arose because of a whole series of uh, uh, disappointments. It has been clear from day one, and it is absolutely clear today, that if we adopt this epistemic exteriority, then we ask the question, what is the indicator of success when we say China has been successful? Metropolitan West has been successful. What are these indicators of success? Is it their GDP growth? Is it their per capita income? Or is it the whole question of what has happened to the laboring poor in these countries? How have they fared? What has happened to the mass of the people? What is the situation with respect to mass welfare? And here I think the capitalist model is something that subverted not only our intellectuals, that is this whole idea that I was talking about of a seamless, more or less, you know, smooth transition out of agriculture into higher productivity industry. It also subverted China's leaders from the 1980s. So I would not call China a success. Because if you look at the criteria of what has happened to the population of China, the standard of living, particularly the rural poor. With the breakup of the communes, with the reform policies in China from the 1980s, those policies were absolutely disastrous for the rural poor. With all its problems and defects, the commune system has had built up a basic welfare system of free elementary health care, free education, and egalitarianism which was a massive achievement for a country which had started with immense wealth and income inequalities, just as our country had done. So don't forget that those who followed the reforms in China were cashing in on 30 years of egalitarianism earlier. They had more room to play with. All right? And where have they brought that country to today? So I would say that you know we use terms like success far more carefully. And as far as our own agriculture is concerned, Abhijit mentioned that there doesn't, you know, people are talking about surpluses now. In fact, not all we have a situation where we are exporting millions of tons of food trees, whereas the standard of living of our population, the average standard, is the lowest in the world now. In terms of grain consumption per capita, we are right at the bottom. We are below the least developed countries average. We are below the African average, okay? So let's not become complacent 
and let us also try and as far as we can to achieve some degree of epistemic exteriority and not to fall in the trap of using the categories that are common in the economic literature, the development literature, which is really not about development at all, which is basically about capitalism and how capitalism can function smoothly. All right? Our definition of de development has to be something very different. <laughs>